Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, and welcome to Think Tech series, Life in the Law. Today I have the pleasure of two guests, Natalie Onazai, who is the current president of Hawaii Women Lawyers. Hi. Hi. Welcome, Natalie. And Trisha Nakamatsu, who is the immediate past president of Hawaii Women Lawyers. And both of them I knew when they were students at the <laughs> UH Law School. Yes. Great. Well, welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So let me start with you, Natalie. Natalie, when did you graduate from the law school? I graduated in 2005. Uh-huh, but actually you ac graduated from UT Austin, UT Austin. I was a visiting student my second year at Richardson. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And Trisha, when did you graduate from the law school? 2004. 2004. So it's interesting because you both have been now lawyers for about 10 years mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and your interest in Hawaii women lawyers is close to my heart because, of course, I was the first president of Hawaii women lawyers almost 40 years ago, a long time ago. So thank you so much for coming. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now. I'm interested in general where we've come as far as lawyers, women lawyers in the state of Hawaii, and what you see has uh, been happening and what the future is. So Natalie, tell us where you're working right now. Um, I'm a staff attorney at the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. I've been there ever since I graduated from law school in 2005. Mm -hmm. I started out as a law clerk mm -hmm. um, for Judge Foley and then Associate Judge Nakamura. Mm -hmm. And about five years ago, I started working as a staff attorney. So all my experience has been with the judiciary. I see. And so was there a deliberate choice in staying in that field after 10 years? To you know, when I started out, I thought it would just be a one-year clerkship, which mm -hmm. was typical at the time. Uh -huh. um, but it just turned out that um, it worked for me and Judge Foley, who I was clerking for at the time, for me to stay on longer. And um, I started to have children. I had three children. I've had tre three children while at the ICA. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it just worked out really well for work-family balance. I mean, the work is challenging. Um, but at the same time, I have the flexibility that I need um, and the control over my work. And, um, you know, it just, it just works out schedule-wise. I see. With raising and, a family. And um, during your 10 years that you've been there, have you noticed an increase in number of women uh, on the bench and the women who are doing your type of work as a staff attorney? I haven't noticed a big change. I mm -hmm. mean, I think the, there's a pretty good... Um, parity of women and men in, at the appellate level mm -hmm. and so we have three women three men at the ICA three women judges three women three, judges yes. three men judges uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, but I know that in the circuit and district courts um, there's a little bit more of a disparity and that's something that we're trying to address mm -hmm. through HWL um, by encouraging more of our members to apply to be judges um, I saw the recent HSBA 2015 statistics showing that about 40% of active attorneys in the state are women, and yet only about one-third of the judges are women. And so we're kind of trying to close that gap through um, different seminars, panel discussions, apprising our members of uh, judicial vacancies and things like that. I see. So, uh, and there are two women on the Supreme Court out of five, is that right? Right. Uh-huh. And the... Um, women on the ICA, the three out of the six. Could mm -hmm. you name them? Yes. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> that's um, Judge Fujise. Alexa Fujise. Alexa Fujise. Uh -huh. um, Judge Catherine Leonard and uh -huh. Judge Lisa Ganoza. Okay, great. And I know at least two of them are from UH Law School. Yes. Which is it. It's wonderful. Okay, do you have any aspirations actually for eventually long-term working <laughs> as a judge? Um, it's something I wouldn't rule out. Uh -huh. uh, maybe you know, for the future, but right now I'm happy being a staff attorney and I still find that to be interesting and challenging work. How many staff attorneys do you have on the ICA? Uh, we have five. And of those, you said how many were women? Two are women. Two are women. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And Trisha, where are you working now? I'm with the prosecuting attorney's office in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. So I actually have an unusual role there. Actually, half the year I do legislative work. Uh -huh. So I'm one of the legislative liaisons for the department. We go to the Capitol and testify. The other half the year I do trials. And so this is a city and county position? Yes. Prosecutor. Yes. As opposed to the state attorney general's office? Correct. So is that similar to the state attorney general's office? Um, Just city and county issues? 
The prosecuting attorney handles the majority of the criminal prosecutions. Mm -hmm. We get right. our authority from the AGs. So technically the AGs has the original jurisdiction, jurisdiction. but they then delegate it to the various county prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And it's only certain cases um, that are more at a state level or uh, where we're conflicted out that I the see. AGs will handle. And what kind of cases do you handle when you're acting as a prosecuting attorney? I do primarily misdemeanors. Uh -huh. um, I did a term in juvenile mm -hmm. uh, offenders, and that was very interesting. That was very uh, uh, so eye-opening. Give us an example of what kind of cases would be in juvenile. They do the full range of cases. They'll do everything from your simple misdemeanors to like other cases. What kind of a misdemeanor? Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Well, obviously not do the traffic, tra but no, not traffic. But they'll do theft, uh, burglaries, drug offenses, minor drug offenses. If they're misdemeanors, or no, everything, no. all the way through, to all see. the way through murder cases. Okay. Yes. Really? Yes. So you handle yes. murder cases. If you're under 18, it's actually very unusual. It is possible to get for a juvenile to be waived up mm -hmm. to the adult courts, but that's very rare. I see. So you represent the uh, city and county in those cases? Yes. Okay. Well, representing the state. Representing the state, but, I work but for it's the city. city. And county. I see. Yes. Okay. And then, as far as your legislative work, I know now is a very <laughs> busy time for you, right? Oh, yes. yes. And what busy. kind of issues do you handle for the. Any you know? bills that come across. Um, the legislature mm -hmm. that have to do with criminal matters. Mm -hmm. It could be anything from human trafficking, drug offenses, probation and parole terms and conditions. So it's not necessarily bills that you would introduce, but you would be responding to other um, bills that have been introduced, or you introduce your own bills too? We do both. Uh -huh. So every year the prosecutor will put together a legislative package, mm -hmm. and those are the issues that are foremost um, important to him for that year and we did put together a package for this year mm -hmm. with about 10 bills in it mm -hmm. and at the same time we'll be testifying on any other hearings that come up okay that so the pertain prosecutors to Keith Keith, Keith kind of share up, right and what are your bills of, of interest this year the top 10 or you don't have to give me all but <laughs> what are all some ten. of the ones the big <laughs> <laughs> oh well um a big push for us is the career criminal unit and that deals with repeat uh, felony offenders some of the most uh, not necessarily white collar, no, but no career criminals, criminal, right? Repeats, very um, mm -hmm. the ones who keep coming back. I see. Um, and those are handled by some of our most experienced deputies. Mm -hmm. But we need funding for that division. It used to be state funded. It's actually a state mandated program. But we need to come back and, and try to get some funding for that. And who's funding it now? It's a combination between city council and AGs. Our funding comes through the AGs from the state. I see. But there's only so much that's allotted for us, even no matter how much we request. And how many, I'm going to break down again, the number of women in your office and uh, the number of men. You know, I don't know the exact figure. Mm -hmm. It's certainly less than half. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that, at least under the current administration, and most of our division chiefs are women. Really? That's something interesting to know, yes. And how many lawyers do you have in your office in general? Over 100. I think anywhere from 100 to 110, perhaps, deputies. That's very large, isn't it? It's a large department. Very large. Okay. Do you travel to the neighbor islands, too? Are you involved in uh, Rarely. I think the only time our deputies will fly to the neighbor islands is for meetings, uh, commissions, state boards, things like that. So every, the other counties have their own equivalent office? Yes. Now, I understand in the past, though, you haven't been doing this for your entire oh, period. No. <laughs> I've been there about almost six years now. I believe this is my sixth year. Before that, I was with the Corporation Council for five years. Mm -hmm. And then before that, a brief stint in private practice, about a year. Okay, so tell me about private practice. What, what Was it a large firm, a small firm? No, it was a very small firm. Only had about six or seven, no, maybe less, six or seven total, so four associates, two partners. So between the two of you, you're the only one who's had some private practice, and I'm wondering why you chose not to stay in private practice. Typically, you know, everybody <laughs> thinks of lawyers and private practice handling all of the big cases and making a lot of money. Yeah, um, and I did have to take a big pay cut. It was, uh, gosh, maybe a fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 pay cut. To, to go, go from private, private practice to, to the government. 
But for me, at that time, I just decided it was worth it um, for the Why? quality of life that I was looking for, just for me personally. And what kind of quality of life? What did you gain by moving to the public sector? It was a huge difference in um, hours, working hours, certainly. Um, going from working every week about 80 hours, maybe anywhere from 70 to 80 hours a week, to, and that was every week. It's, it's different when it's just once in a while here and there, but when it's every week, it, it gets to be a, a different level of stress. And what kind of work me. were you doing in private practice? Was it Insurance defense, primarily Insur workers' compensation. So it wasn't that it was trial work that required this? Litigation. It was, oh, it yes. was litigation, yes. okay. Wow. And then when I went to Corporation Council, it was a huge difference. Although they work very hard there, the hours are 7.45 to 4.30 every day. And if you're there past 5, there's probably something very special or very big that you're working on for that reason. Nice. Otherwise, uh, 4.30. Well, I know that you both, as we've identified you, as you're mm -hmm. the current president of Hawaii Women Lawyers HWL, mm -hmm. and you're the past president, immediate past president. So tell me why you got involved in Hawaii Women Lawyers as organizations and what it can do or what did you hope that it would do for our profession? For me, I got involved as a student when I was still at the law school. I just thought that it was so great to have this, uh, it's a support system, it's a networking system, it was a way for me to meet more experienced, some very senior um, attorneys and even judges as a law student, which I thought was an amazing opportunity and to be able to just get to know them, to be able to have that connection, and to be able to develop relationships where I could turn to them for advice or questions when I needed it. And this is actually a plug for attending law school here in Hawaii, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> that was a plus. Yeah. So even if you're going to a great mainland law school, you won't have that opportunity unless you're here during the school year or maybe during the summer. Okay, and what about you, Natalie? Uh, you know, I think I got involved when I was a student, too, as a 2 well visiting student at Richardson. And at the time, I wanted to do community service, actually, and I thought, well, I'm a woman and I'm going to be a lawyer, so, you know, I'll, I'll check this out. And I went to the meetings and I found it was just really good experience um, being at a meeting, speaking in a meeting. Um, and then as I got more involved with the board and becoming a director and holding different offices on the board, um, just for personal development, you know, I learned how to take minutes, I learned how to run a meeting. Um, at the ICA, we're kind of sequestered away. We don't interact with the public very much. And so it's just a great way to get out and be involved in the legal community. And of course, I do want to promote women in the profession and in the community. So it's something that I feel passionately about. And um, it's nice to be around other women who are like-minded. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, very supportive and, and nurturing. It's just a nice way to grow, to grow in the profession with, uh, with that group right. around you. So, yeah. Trisha, when you were president, which was last year, did you have any major projects that, I know we've been working a little bit on the history of Hawaii Women Lawyers, but mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could give us a little... So, summary. that was a big push. I don't know if we want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about now. it. Okay, so this year, 2016, is the 40th anniversary of the founding of Hawaii Women Lawyers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, I was uh, there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, we really wanted to make a special push to... Uh, look back and remember what started it all, how the challenges that she went through and everything that had to occur for us to get to where we are today as an organization. So we have a video project that's pending and we had had interviews with you and some of our other founders and early presidents to really document that history and hear some of those stories that many of our members probably have never heard before. Right, there were struggles because there were so few women lawyers then. Mm -hmm. um, there were uh, no women judges at the time. There were very few women in, at partners in law firms. Uh, women as CEOs of companies, this was all a uh, new ground for women. And uh, first impression, what do you do with women who want to take maternity leaves who are lawyers in a law firm? You know, well, how do you compensate them? You know, there's been a lot of pay inequity right. over the years, which still exists. So and that is still an issue. Yes, yes it is. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, other things that we worked on last year, we wanted to make more of a push to reach out to neighbor island members, because right now our membership is largely based on Oahu. So 
in order to represent all of the women lawyers in Hawaii, we'd really like to expand the neighbor island base. Oh, we worked on that. Okay, well, we're going to go to a short break. So we'll be right back. This is Carol Mon Lee, Life in the Law, with uh, my guest Natalie and Trisha. We'll be right back. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state. Or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii and Life in the Law. So Natalie and Tricia, we we're talking about Hawaii women lawyers in your recent roles as president and past president. We really appreciate that. Um, what is the status of women lawyers now in both in our community and nationwide? Do you have some numbers, Natalie, you can share with us? Um, besides what I've said about yeah. in Hawaii, yes. um, well, I did Nationally. notice uh, mm -hmm. yeah, na the National Association of Women Lawyers recently um, put out a report um, surveying private firms on you know what the demographics were um, within their firms, and um, even though about half of the law school population is made up of women, um, and that's been the case for a long time, and even in some schools there are more women graduating than men, um, there's still a big disparity in compensation. Um, women at the upper levels um, in management, in the compensation divisions within firms, I think one statistic was 18% of the um, equity partners in firms are women, which is a really huge gap. And, you know, I. I don't know what accounts for that. I can only speculate, and I haven't worked much in private practice. I did have a summer position in estate planning, but you know, I don't know, and, and that's part of what we try to get to the bottom of at HWL. We've put out a survey. We want to continue doing that because we don't know how much of it has to do with some kind of bias uh, within the law firm culture, whether implicit or explicit, or if it's women themselves who just um, don't feel compelled for whatever reason to um, be promoted into those positions and to advocate for higher compensation. That's very interesting. So in your cases, you both chose, you opted not to go into private practice or stay in private practice because of these other uh, family needs or choices that you wanted to make. But for those women who are actually in private law practice, there is still this disparity, right? Disparity as far as making partner, disparity in compensation, mm -hmm. disparity in decision making. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And so do you have any ideas? Has H you, s you mentioned a survey. What, when is a survey going to be coming out, and what, what kinds of questions would you ask? We did one last year, primarily focused on judgeships, um, trying to find out why more women aren't applying for judgeships in Hawaii, and what, if anything, could HWO do to encourage more women. And what did you find out? Uh, the results were largely due to uh, they felt that the system was somewhat political, that they might not know enough people, their name's not widely known enough to get selected. So these are women who chose not to apply for judgeships, even yes. though they may have been interested. Mm -hmm. And their reasoning was because it's such a political mm -hmm. uh, process, which and some something of them else had that applied. We also, something else that we also noticed is that overall, women seem more inclined not to apply if they think that they are not as qualified as they should be. And do you find, uh, I know the <laughs> answer to that, as far as men, they would mm -hmm. still apply, is that right? Yes. Regardless of We've how had a number of p panel discussions on this with the Judicial Selection Commission, the different appointing authorities, um, women judges. And this applies not just to judgeships, I think, but probably um, career opportunities in general. Mm -hmm. But um, 
it seems that studies show that women aren't as willing to promote themselves. Just there's a confidence gap between men and women. You've probably, you're probably familiar with the book Lean In. So a tendency for women to lean back and maybe not, um, not to promote themselves as much. And even if they are as qualified or more qualified than men who are um, you know, up for these positions, they may tend to not fill out the application because they don't have every single qualification, which isn't necessary. Um, or wow. they'll wait for someone else to encourage them to apply instead of just going for it because it's what they want to do. Very interesting. And of course, we know that the source of all that is not just while you're in college or high school or law school, but from childhood on and the basic raising of children and how gender uh, stereotypes kind of play into this so very very interesting so as far as the judges um, let me have you fix that so as far as judges and women not applying have you found that um, there is a way that you can encourage them is there something that HWL can do in terms of mentoring in terms of programming HW has taken a number of steps in addition to the various seminars and brown bags that we've had where judges, retired judges, women judges come and address people who are interested to answer any questions, dispel any myths, and just provide general encouragement and information. Um, we are exploring, I think, a mentoring type of program mm -hmm. that would allow people who are interested to actually be partnered with a retired judge, for example, who could help them through that process. Oh. We've, we've done a lot to try to demystify the process, too. Um, whether it's taking out the application, putting it down, you know, this is what it is, going through it section by section, um, having the judges come and say, look, this was intimidating to me, too, when I went through the application process. This is what I did to prepare. Um, or to have the appointing authorities come and say, these are some of the things we look for. Um, maybe you have these qualifications, or um, someone say to say, I've applied many, many times. <laughs> I, I applied it. 10 times before I got the position. Don't let that dissuade you. So we don't know how effective these efforts have been. We haven't done a lot of follow-up to see how many people ended up applying or were successful um, in applying afterward, but that might be something we should look into. Yeah, and so let's extrapolate that to the further why is it important to have more women judges in our community? We really feel that there is an inherent benefit just to having more women on the bench. And we definitely want them to be qualified women, so <laughs> it's far be it from us to, to um, recommend unqualified anyone. But we but know that the many women lawyers now, because you said we have how many women in the bar now in Hawaii? A third at least, uh, right? Yes. Um, so uh, about 40% of the women active attorneys are women. Yep. So 40% yeah. of the bar in Hawaii are women. So yeah. it's certainly enough mm -hmm. of a pool to draw on for oh, qualified yes. women. Mm -hmm. And so we do feel there's an inherent benefit to mm -hmm. having more equity on the bench because women do make up half the world. They hold up half of the sky and they come with their own unique perspectives. While everyone, all of the judges are going to be following the same laws and interpreting the same laws, there comes a certain amount of subjectivity, a certain amount of uh, personal history and experience perspective that's going to come into play. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, just as an aside, because as we, as you know, the legislature right now, one of the bills they're considering is changing our uh, selection of judges to an elected um, method of selecting judges. Does HWL or you have opinions on that? HWL has submitted testimony on the three bills that were proposed um, to amend the Constitution to elect judges and also um, to have the um, sen to have the Senate confirm I'm sorry approve uh, terms uh, for for judges or to re approve retention basically um, I'm a little reluctant to talk about it because I am a judiciary employee, but okay. I can tell you that HWL has submitted um, testimony in opposition. In opposition, yes. okay. Yeah, I don't, okay, if it's comfortable for you <laughs> I don't know on if behalf it's appropriate, but Trisha. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. I, I, against 
an election of judges? There have been studies that show it actually is a detriment to women and minorities to hold judicial elections. And that's probably due to a lot of the same issues, that you won't have as many women who are willing to run for an elected office, and you see that in politics as well. But whereas men might have that confidence to put themselves out there, to make it publicly known that they're running for this position, and to feel that they have everything it takes to win, you might not. Oh, studies have found that not as many women are going to meet that. Right. And, and Natalie, in the beginning, our first session, you uh, mentioned that percentage-wise in Hawaii, women, interestingly, are very well represented, actually, in government jobs. Mm -hmm. right just like you two are mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit about the reason for that in part was as you said your lifestyle choices the money versus time and other other things so do mm -hmm. you find that how do you factor that into the types of jobs that women have chosen I read an article recently that said women may be attracted to government positions because there are three things that they want out of work. This is just a generalization, but control, predictability, and flexibility. Control over? Control over their work, I guess, um, you know, not being micromanaged so much so they can have the flexibility to go somewhere during the day as long as they get what they are expected to get done. Right. Um, and yeah, and so they can have control over their schedule as well as, you know, how they uh, prioritize their work. Right. So, and I'm going to get a little personal here, Natalie, because okay. I know you have three children mm -hmm. and your husband, whom I've met, and he's a doctor. Is that correct? Yes. So how do you two <laughs> balance a lawyer and a doctor and three young children? How old are your children? <laughs> They're four, six, and eight. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's always a challenge. They're always changing. Um, I, I'm really fortunate to have a husband who's very proactive and, and, and engaged as a parent. Um, he's not a typical doctor in the sense that he, he works one week on, one week off. So he has more free time um, to get things done at home. But when he's on, it's very busy. Um, we hire help. You know, we do have babysitters and we have people to help us around the house. We don't have family here on the island. So that makes it a little, a little bit more difficult. But I think uh, we both want careers, and we both always knew that we wanted to have children. So we're willing to make it work, whatever it takes. And so in yeah. addition to that, does your husband also do some uh, community activities too? Does he, is he able to squeeze in that or sports <laughs> or something else? Um, he likes to play sports. Mm -hmm. uh, we both find that that's a good way to de-stress. And that's so important too. I mean. Um, you need to find time for yourself and we both make it a priority and we make space for each other to do that. I mean, I, we both respect that that we need to do it. Um, so, so yeah. it's very interesting because I know, you know, your choices and I would assume when you have career and you have family uh, that sometimes something like community work, like working for Hawaii women lawyers or sports might suffer, but I, we mm -hmm. appreciate <laughs> that you're able to balance that. Thank and you. Tricia, so tell me about your balance balancing act because I can tell from your you're on so many boards and I other know. activities <laughs> and that might be partly due to the fact that I don't have children <laughs> yet we'll see how what the future brings <laughs> there's plenty of time <laughs> but what uh, are yes. the other boards that you're working on besides so Hawaii Women Lawyers I uh, media past present for Hawaii Women Lawyers and I really enjoy my work with them so I hope to continue I'm also a director for Hawaii Women's Legal Foundation, which is the sister organization, a grant-making yes. organization closely tied to HWL. I'm the what else? vice <laughs> president <laughs> Let for me tell you what you're doing. the Yin Sit Sha, Punalu Yin Sit Sha Society, which uh -huh. is a Chinese um, Women in filmmaking. I'm secretary for Hawaii Women in Filmmaking, Okay. which is also a... a new passion of mine. Right, well, very busy. When, one important point I want to make is that we both, working in government, are doing public service through our work. And exactly. so it feels nice to, that was one of the draws for me as well. For and government staying work. in government work is that, yeah, I, I really believe in what I'm doing and I feel like I'm making, I, I'm c contributing something to the community through my work. So, um, okay, kind of Good. accomplish both in one. Well, we're going to have you hold that thought. We're going to go to one more break. This is Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii, Life in the Law with my guests Natalie and Tricia, presidents of Hawaii Women Lawyers. We'll be right back.
Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope that you will tune in and watch the show. It is inspiring and uplifting and educational also. We talk with artists of all different ilk. We talk with them about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, most dear to my heart, why they do it. And it, it never ceases to be fascinating when you get the answer to that question. I hope you'll join us on Center Stage, 2 o'clock Wednesday afternoons. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee with my guest, Natalie Yonazai and Trisha Nakamatsu from Hawaii Women Lawyers. So we were talking about some of the great work that Hawaii Women Lawyers is doing. Trisha, are you going to tell me a little bit more about your regular program of activity and some of the programs that you've been running that help the Yes, just officials? over the past couple of years, we've developed a relationship with um, Ellen Carson, Gabi. Yes. And uh, she had been all these years maintaining a ladies' luncheons, lady, lady lawyers', lawyers luncheons. luncheons program which um, has now that HWL is back as a sponsor developed into a subject-based brown bag event so every month HWL partnered with HSPA will host a brown bag event where we bring in various um, experts people who are um, knowledgeable in those subject matters to discuss anything from uh, Rainmaking to family life balance. Um, I know you have one planning. coming up on obstreperous counsel. Yes, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> coming up. Mm -hmm. Some uh, some of the other topics you mentioned. I know you just mentioned a few. Do you have any? What else is coming up? Oh well, there was one recently on cyberbullying. Um, I don't know what else we have yeah. planned. There's been they're, a lot every really, month. really, really interesting. And there's always very animated um, personal discussion that goes on. It's more of a conversation. I mean, you listen to the speaker, but then people share a lot. It's also a good networking opportunity. Um, I think it'd be of interest to any any woman attorney. Mm -hmm. Are your are your programs limited to women attorneys? They're open to anyone in really the public. And um, we do have a lot of women attorney uh, attorneys how many women? How many great. women members do you have in Hawaii Women Lawyers now? Uh, we have a little over three hundred members, some of whom are men. I think we have mm -hmm. about ten male members. And mm -hmm. how many women lawyers in Hawaii? I know we mentioned um, we're forty percent of the bar, but how mm -hmm. many does that equate to in terms of about a quarter of the women uh, practicing women in Hawaii, uh, practicing women attorneys Active. in Hawaii. Attorney. Are yes. active. Oh, okay. sorry, active. But do we have a number? We're we talking about thousands. Maybe a thousand. I How think many the total, the total active attorneys? Bar is over four thousand. Yeah, and so if we're looking at active women, it's uh -huh. about thirteen hundred. Uh -huh. And you mentioned that men are also open uh, to membership and mm -hmm. uh, attending any of the HWL programs, right? Absolutely. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. Do you have issues relating to men and men in practice, or men and women in practice that? Overlap? Is there a lot of overlap with the HSBA in their programs? Well, we're actually having the Lady Lawyers Luncheons. Actually, we're in the process of changing the name because the whole, f whole format is in transition. Um, but they actually are going to be held at the HSBA conference room now. And we're going to be doing more with video teleconferencing so that we can transmit out to people on the neighbor islands. Um, and also, some of the lunches um, will offer CLE credit. Oh, great. So there's oh, some overlap that's new. there. Yeah. Yes, so I think that'll be a big draw. Do you, how do you approach issues that are broader than, let's say, professional issues, whether it's community issues, whether mm -hmm. it's domestic violence or poverty or homelessness? Do you get involved in any of those issues as an organization? We do have a gender equity committee, and they've been great about uh, working with some of the community organizations, such as Kalihi Kukua Valley, um, some of the mm -hmm. other. Uh, women's organizations, Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women. And how, do we, how does HWL support those 
organizations? We have sponsored our own events at some of these locations, such as KKV, to try to educate the women there. And most of these are disadvantaged populations so as far as their rights, I their, mm -hmm. their uh, resources that they can turn to. So it's providing legal back, uh, information or services to different groups of yes. people who might need them. And we also have a legislative committee that proposes bills um, to support women and uh, women and um, children. More, yeah, children. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking uh, specifically of young women and um, school age children, um, sex education in the Department of Education. Um, Do you have a bill this year? Any bills this year? We yeah. have a number that we're going to be testifying in support of. Yeah, not me personally, but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're just beginning to discuss to discuss that, and we're we're going to decide. Do you work with the? Is there support. still a women's caucus at the legislature? Do you work with the women's caucus? The legislative committee we'll does. Get that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, on a community basis, we also do other things such as um, in recent years, there's been a more of a push for films and documentaries that are really getting the word out to the community about disparities that still exist between genders and why that might be and what can be done about it. So we've co-sponsored, uh, we actually held our own film screening event a couple of years ago for a couple of films, complete with speakers, q and A it was very well attended. So are you working on anything right now, any film right now? The most recent one that we co-sponsored was The Hunting Ground, and that had to do with sex assault on the college campuses. Ah. And that was co-sponsored with a number of women's organizations. So where was the film made? It was no. not made in Hawaii. That film was not, no, yeah. it was not but made we in were, Hawaii. But Hawaii Women Lawyers sponsored a people screening to attend event the screening, right? with uh, panelists and question and answer. Okay. So I want to get a little more into where you see Hawaii Women Lawyers going, what other issues that you would like to see the organization address. Is there any areas in particular that you see coming up or ongoing? I know you mentioned the judiciary. Yes, definitely. That still continues to be one of our biggest pushes, and, and more so um, than it might have been a few years ago. We found that, especially with a lot of the women jo judges retiring recently, in the past several years, we've had a lot of the women judges retiring. Um, we'd really like to see those positions filled with women as much as possible. So we are going to continue to have the same kind of push, the seminars, the um, mentoring type of opportunities to encourage more women to apply for judgeships. Mm -hmm. Right now we're also focused on planning our annual re awards reception that will be in April. So um, we've just chosen our awardees and um, it's just a really nice way to recognize people who've contributed in support of our mission. And what kind of categories do you have for the awards? Um, President's Award, Outstanding Woman Lawyer, Distinguished Service, Outstanding Judge, and what am I missing? <laughs> Lifetime achievement. Lifetime, Lifetime achievement, achievement, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always a big and very fun event, and we, we just look forward to being able to, to recognize people for what they've done. I know it's a great turnout, too, for that event every year. Yeah. yeah. So personally, do you have particular issues that you'd like to work on, whether it's within an organization like HWL or in your job or uh, other other ways are you interested in involved in your in children's issues because you have three children or health issues because your husband is in the medical field or certain community legal issues um, no I mean um, I think ahead past my term as president of HWL and I mm -hmm. still would like to be involved in community activities I, I'm still exploring what options are available but as far as HWL goes, I think we could probably do more work in um, work-life balance because that's an issue that just comes up over and over again, no matter what the topic of the seminar is. And it's something I think I have a lot of personal experience with, and it's always a struggle. And I think it's probably a major obstacle for women in the workplace. Um, so the more we can find ways to change a workplace to accommodate women or find resources for women so that to enable them to work more in private practice at the upper, upper, upper levels or the leadership positions, the better. What kind of resources do you see that could be developed? Oh, things like child care, um, things like working remotely. Um, does the state now have child care support for working moms? No, but I think it would be wonderful. I know the city and county does um, 
does have like Seagull School. They have, you know, they subsidize uh, that daycare center and the federal government has one in the federal building. Actually, my kids have gone to that one, but I didn't have priority as a non-federal employee. Um, so I think it would be great if the state has something like that. <laughs> it's Is there anything not anything I've explored, not that I know of, oh. but it, that would be a great benefit to Maybe women, women and the men. the state, HWL could... Yes. Spearhead. <clears throat> yeah, because another thing I wanted to say is I don't think those issues are unique to women. Um, I, I have uh, co-workers, male co-workers who have families, and it's it's something that they deal with on an ongoing basis. So it's um, it would be good to involve men maybe more in the conversation through HWL because they should be aware of the, I the issues that women face because they're working with women. And also, they might benefit personally from some of the topics we discuss as well. Sure, and as, as we have the aging pro population, parental care, um, aging parents and being able to take time off to take care of you know, other families with illnesses or aging parents. And that's a responsibility that often falls on women for some reason, but I do think that's also changing. Yeah. Yes. Did you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, personally, over the past few years, I was involved in those film screenings that HWL sponsored or mm -hmm. co-sponsored, and I've really come to appreciate the impact that mass media has on the perception of women, not only women perceiving themselves, but as how society perceives women and what can be done about that. Um, I think it's a multifaceted problem with multifaceted solutions, um, hopefully in the works. But that's really something that I'm, I'm interested in right now. And while we mentioned mm -hmm. the family needs, I think yes. another big bill that's being heard in the legislature that Hawaii has, uh, HWL has been very supportive of is the paid um, family medical leave. Oh, right? that's true. And maternity leave. Mm -hmm. Both maternity and paternity? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And how long would be the paid period? I'm not proposed? actually sure. It fluctuates, uh, uh, <laughs> but I see. I think. Yeah. Um, going along the lines of community work, we're also going to be sponsoring an Access to Justice Room in 2017. There's actually a long wait list because so many people have volunteered, and that's something I'd like to get more involved with as well. So Access to Justice, can you yeah. just give me a 30-second summary of what does that mean? Well, at the Access to Justice self-help centers in the courtrooms across the state, uh, attorneys volunteer to help um, litigants um, navigate the legal, the legal process, basically. And so different organizations will sponsor um, a room and then take turns. Attorneys will be trained and volunteer to help people fill out forms or, um, you know, just tell them what to do at a hearing. I actually don't know all the specifics, but it's something that I've been very curious about. Yeah. And it, it affects women, it, it affects you know low-income people uh, who can't afford an attorney, so it does a lot to create more equality within the system. Great. We'll just have a few more seconds. Is there anything that we can do to help you, the public can do to help Hawaii Women Lawyers or your organization continue to do its good work? Do you see anything that uh, could support you more? Um, I think general public awareness about Hawaii women lawyers and the work that we do and the particular issues that we're interested in is just something that we really, really want to encourage. Um, and again, it's men, it's women, everyone should be, and I believe to some extent are, interested in these issues because it affects all of us. Yeah, you know, I started Hawaii women lawyers in the beginning and it was always the goal was that someday we wouldn't need Hawaii women lawyers because everyone would have, would be supported. So thank you so much for appearing on Think Tech Hawaii today. My guest, Natalie Onazai, uh, current president of Hawaii Women Lawyers, and Trisha Nakamatsu, the immediate past president of Hawaii Women Lawyers. Thank you so much for appearing. Thank you for having us. Thank you. This is Carol Mon Lee, and uh, thank you on behalf of Think Tech Hawaii. Today's show, Life in the Law, and we'll be seeing you next time. Aloha. Sorry, I went off a little early. I didn't even wait.
no way. Thank you, Charles.